the dots between apparently unconnected people, organizations, countries, uh, cultures, that the, the picture starts to appear because you're putting the pieces of the puzzle together and suddenly the picture appears. And after 20 years, I can say absolutely categorically with enormous supporting evidence in every area you'd want to talk about that this is the situation. A network of interbreeding bloodlines families came out of the ancient world, particularly um, an area of, uh, called Mesopotamia, formerly Sumer, that they said was the cradle of civilization, according to conventional uh, historians, okay. and became Babylon. And out of that area, now Iraq, of course, they've not gone into Iraq just for oil or, or just for this or just for anything. It's a number of reasons. And one of the reasons, Gabriel, is that that area of land, what we now call Iraq, Mesopotamia, has enormous historical significance for these bloodlines, for these families that are behind it. So these bloodlines expanded out of that area of the world. Um, they became the, uh, the, the bloodlines behind the Roman Empire. They moved up into uh, northern Europe. They became the aristocracy and royal families of, of Europe. And then through the uh, so-called Great British Empire, they exported uh, those bloodlines and the secret society network through which they manipulate events. Uh, across the world, to the Americas, to Africa, to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand, uh, everywhere. And um, they then had this sleight of hand, uh, which they called um, independence for the former colonies of the British Empire. And the French Empire, I mean, the, the French, all, all, all these bloodlines operate in, in all countries, but Britain is particularly uh, important, uh, along with um, Rome and the, the Vatican and all that side of it, which is not actually a religion uh, uh, of the Roman Church. It's the former Church of Babylon relocated. That, that's what it is if you do the research. And so um, you, you had this situation where um, the former uh, colonial countries were given um, independence. But what actually happened was one form of dictatorship was replaced by a much more effective one. The dictatorship that was in place is... A dictatorship you can see, touch and taste. The people involved know how they stand. I'm talking about colonial rule. I mean, the, the former United States knew they were ruled from, from, uh, from Britain. Uh, I'm talking communism, fascism, apartheid. All these are uh, dictatorships that you can see, touch and taste. You know where you are. The greatest form of dictatorship is a dictatorship you cannot see. A prison without the bars. Because people will sit in the cell forever, not realizing they're actually in a cell and thinking they're free. And so what happened was that um, these colonial countries, like the, 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 the British Empire, etc., they on the surface withdrew. But they left behind in those countries the bloodline, their agents, and crucially the secret society network, like I say, that, that they used to manipulate world events. And... They've gone on controlling those countries ever since. And, and I can describe it very simply, the structure that they've created. Imagine a spider's web with the spider at the center, and the spider is at operational level in all this in Europe. Um, the web goes out, and each um, strand is an organization, a country, uh, uh, whatever, that is answerable to the spider. So ultimately, the center controls everything. And it's structured globally like a transnational corporation. Um, with with, with a, a transnational, they have a headquarters, and then they have subsidiary uh, companies in each country. Okay. And those subsidiary uh, uh, companies in each country follow the orders of the headquarters. They do what they're told, they do it as they're told, and they do it according to the corporate blueprint. What this network of families have done is set up a structure exactly like that, except they're secret societies. So you have the, the uh, center in Europe, the spider, and then in each country, the United States, Ireland, uh, France, wherever, they have a network of secret societies um, and bloodline families that have the job of controlling that country's finance, banking, etc., uh, business, government, any political party that has any chance of forming a government, 
control of the media at ownership level, etc. And so when the, uh, the headquarters says, okay, we're now going to go to this stage of the operation, then these subsidiary networks in each country go to work to introduce that in their sphere of influence. And this is why, as I've traveled the world, like I say, I've been to 50 countries so far researching this, I have seen again and again the same things being introduced in different countries at the same time, justified by the same excuses. And it's possible because of this uh, this network, this uh, transnational corporation, if you like, of, of secret societies. And this is what is operating in the European Union and what brought the European Union about. You see, from the very start, what we're now seeing the European Union becoming, a centralized dictatorship, a uh, bureaucratic dictatorship, just like the, the Politburo, etc., of the uh, Soviet Union, was planned from the start. But there's two techniques that these organizations, this, this organization uses more than any other to advance its uh, demands and its agenda. One, I called years ago, problem, reaction, solution. This works like this. You want to change society in a certain way. And you know that if you openly just announce that's what you're going to do, you're going to get an, a, 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 an adverse reaction from the public in, in large numbers. So you don't announce what you're going to do. You, you play problem, reaction, solution. Stage one, you create a problem. It could be a terrorist attack, it could be a war, it could be an economic collapse, whatever uh, would produce the solution that you're looking for. You then tell the public through an unquestioning, pathetic uh, mainstream media the version of this problem that you want them to believe, i.e. Uh, bin Laden orchestrated 9-11 from a cave in Afghanistan. Well, he must okay. have had a good battery on his <laughs> cell phone then. Um, and the, um, the, you want the public at stage two to react to your version of the problem with fear, with outrage, and with words to the effect of something must be done, what, uh, what are they going to do about it? And they, those who have covertly created the problem and got someone else blamed for it, <laughs> got the reaction, do something, they then offer the solutions to the problems they've created, which is why as a result of 9-11, we are now a, a, a fast uh, entering deeper and deeper into an Orwellian state justified by uh, uh, fighting terrorism. Now, the other one, very, very um, significant to the European Union, the other mass manipulation technique, I call the totalitarian tiptoe. And that works like this. You're at stage A, like they were when before the um, common market was, uh, the so-called free trade area was even suggested. And they knew they were going to... Um, point Z, which was a fully fledged, centralized United States of Europe, centrally controlled and controlling every area of, of everyone's life that lives in that, er in that region. But if they'd have announced Z or anything like it after the Second World War, when tens of millions of people died stopping the central control of Europe by the Nazis, who wanted to introduce something very similar to the uh, European Union, okay. then there would have been outrage. So what they've done is they sell first at a, a B a free trade area, nothing to worry about, good for jobs. Um, no, don't worry about it, it's just jobs, it's just trade. And then step by step, all planned, Gabriel, uh, they uh, talk about uh, oh, well, we, just to make it more efficient, if we could just have a bit more centralization of power here, it would make it more efficient and work better. And so they've gone on. And it was planned all along, and now we're reaching uh, deeper and deeper into, into where they really want to go, which is that centralized uh, dictatorship that I talked about. It already kind of is becoming that. I mean, I've seen a figure that something like 75% of laws passed uh, in, and, and imposed on, on Britain now are actually originating in the European Union. And the, yes. idea, the idea is to, and, and, and Irish people need to understand this, just like British people and everyone else, the idea ultimately is to, is to destroy nation states 
and break them up into regions. They want a European Union of regions, and some of the maps have even come to light. Yeah, I had seen I had seen those maps. Now, let me just get back to something uh, specifically within the Lisbon Treaty. Um, we did a show last week. Um, on the, or a couple of weeks ago on the on the Lisbon Treaty, we had uh, James Peter Bond and uh, James Reynolds from the Irish Farmers for No. Um, without even adding in the the outcome that this group, this shadowy elite, have, um, what we're being asked to do is vote uh, on a referendum that we democratically last year said no to, um, and it's also the same. Um, constitution in essence as was uh, shot down in 2005 by both the the Dutch and the French so now in mere weeks we're going out to be um, supposedly voting again on this um, democratic uh, treaty Uh, just from a factual point of view um, that alone should have people asking questions um, without even adding in all of the information that you bring to the table and ask people to join the dots and see the bigger picture um, because it's it's the I suppose the erosion of the democracy the democracy and the, the democratic the illusion of democracy is being fast tracked uh, and for example um, the signs now are up all over uh, say in, in my local area the government, the Fianna Fáil, who's the party in, in power uh, at present, have but signed... But the hapless Brian Cowan. Um, <laughs> um, I don't want to say anything just in case I get sued. Uh, he, um, he, he always reminds me whenever I see him, Brian Cowan, as a frightened little boy who's, who's being told off. And, you know, the things you're raising here, uh, Gabriel, um, are, are absolutely right, because what this second referendum is saying to the Irish people, if they would see it, is you don't matter. We don't care what you think. I, I you know, I'm not kind of uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a prophet pulling things out of the ether. But within minutes of the Irish uh, referendum saying no, I was saying um, on my website that they're going to come back for another go because. The agenda had got the wrong answer. They're not interested in what the people think. This is a plan that's been playing out decade after decade since the uh, common market was was introduced. And they are not going to take no for an answer um, from mere people um, who don't matter to them. See, I've been saying for years, uh, when something makes no sense in terms of why something's being done against all kind of evidence that it should be done when it has no justice in terms of what's being done compared with what's just and right and no argument or debate put forward um, against what is being done unjustly and and um, and and irrationally apparently then that, that has no that debate has no effect whatsoever on on the outcome That's the agenda, because the agenda is not going to take no for an answer. That's the idea. And what's happening in Ireland now with the second referendum is is it's the agenda of the of the families saying we're not taking no for an answer. You go back and do it again. It's not the first time they've done this. This is why it was so easy to predict uh, uh, after the first Irish vote. They did it in Denmark. They've done it elsewhere. Hey, you've got the wrong got the wrong uh, result here. You go back and, and, and sort it out. And I'll tell you this, because this is the way it works. Brian Cowan would have been given his orders in no uncertain terms. You sort this out. And the reason that uh, Gordon Brown has not had a referendum uh, of the same kind in uh, Britain is because he knows, and the, uh, the, the families know, they would have massively lost it. Uh, same with many other countries in Europe. And that's why they changed uh, after the, the Dutch and, uh, and French votes rejected the, the Constitution. They knew then it was not worth going back because the Dutch and the, uh, the French w- were clearly so adamant they were not going to vote uh, uh, yes the second time. So 
instead of going back on that occasion to, for a second vote they knew they'd lose, they just change uh, the constitution into a treaty and then say, oh, it's a treaty now, so there's, there's no reason for, uh, for referendums. And only, uh, as I understand it, because of the Irish constitution, is this, is this vote ever taking place in the first place in, in, in Ireland. Without that constitution, the Irish people would never have been given a chance to vote because they don't want to hear what the people think. That's not what it's all about. You know, there was um, a uh, Russian dissident uh, called Vladimir Blokovsky who um, visited the European Parliament in 2006. And he is a, a, a guy who, who referred to the uh, European Union as a monster, an absolute mirror of the Politburo, which he knew all about. And interestingly, he said that he was given, when he was in the Soviet Union, access to official documents describing a meeting um, in January 1989 when David Rockefeller, who is the Rockefeller family are one of these bloodlines, Henry Kissinger, he's a, an, a, an agent for these uh, bloodlines, and the French uh, president or former French president, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, turned up to visit Gorbachev, January 1989. Now, According to these documents uh, reported by uh, Vladimir Bukowski, uh during the conversation, uh, Gustave d'Estaing intervened and said to Gorbachev the following. Mr. President, I cannot tell you exactly when it will happen, probably within 15 years, but Europe is going to be a federal state and you have to prepare yourself for that. You have to work out with us. Uh, and the European leaders, how you would react to that, how you would allow the other Eastern European countries to interact with it, or how to become part of it. You have to be prepared. Now, he's saying, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, in 1989, mm. that there's going to be a federal state, and he's speaking three years before even the Maastricht Treaty turned the community into the European Union. And who drafted the planned uh, the European constitution that's now the treaty? Gistard Estaing. This is, um, people need to understand this. This is a long-term plan to enslave the people of the world, but to enslave in the European Union uh, case the, the people of, of, of the expanding European Union. And the Irish people have a chance to put the brakes on this here to throw a spanner in the works, and they will regret it for the, in, the rest of their lives if they don't say no again. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Um, again, the, I, I want to just make something clear here so that when people are listening, because what you're saying um, is, to me, uh, makes sense, uh, but it takes a while for the information to integrate itself in the inside. The signs that are all over from the Fianna Fáil party are vote yes, it's Europe is good for the economy and other similar signs, which speaks to me um, that w yes, we're, we don't care about democracy. Here is what we are trying to persuade you of, which is the antithesis of democracy. And if people could just see that alone, that one fact, there is no debate there's no information um, coming from the elected representatives of the human beings on this nation, in this nation. There is a persuasion and a, um, a sales pitch that's going on. If people could just see that and ask themselves, what is this about? That would be a start. So I, I, I agree completely. No. If Gabriel, Gabriel, I could say a few things about that. Uh, go for it. You're absolutely right. Um, what, we're, what we're seeing with um, good for the economy and you know, the economy is not very good, so we, we, we need the, to be in Europe and all that stuff. That's problem, reaction, solution. It's a, a fantastically extreme example of it in Iceland. Iceland wasn't uh, talking about going headstrong into the European Union until its banking system was systematically targeted. It wasn't an accident. And, of course, it created um, financial mayhem in Iceland. And now what's Iceland doing? It's being fast-tracked into the European Union because that's the way of saving the um, I I Iceland economy. Problem, reaction, solution. Frighten them to death and then o offer them the saviour. And the other thing is that, you know, if you want to control a, a game, say a football match, it's no good controlling one side. 
Because if you control one side, you will influence the game. You will not be able to predict the outcome of the game, the score, before the first uh, board is kicked. And that's what these guys want. They're not interested in, you know, uh, outcomes that are uncallable. They want to make sure the outcomes are as certain as they can before the process has started. So when we're looking at political parties, for instance... Um, they don't just control one political party, and if that political party gets in, oh, we're controlling the Irish government now, or we're controlling the British government now for the next five years or so. No, no. They control all parties that have every chance of forming a government. So whether Tony Blair or Gordon Brown is in Downing Street or David Cameron is irrelevant, because the same uh, network of families are in Downing Street controlling events, whatever. They uh, control the media. They control... Um, uh, the, the institutions of society, and if they want to destroy a politician, they'll destroy him. And if they want to um, destroy a party, they'll destroy it. And for instance, um, what happened, this is an example of, of how it works, when they wanted Margaret Thatcher in power for a long time during the 1980s, they targeted the um, Labour Party, and they ensured that a series of leaders, uh, and there was total uh, insurrection and infighting during that period and a very unpopular prime minister margaret thatcher therefore got term after term not because the people uh, in a majority wanted her but they they saw the opposition as completely unelectable what happened then is they wanted tony blair to come in um because they have to switch parties every now and again or people will say hey we're in a one-party state um we are, it's got different masks on it and different names, that's all. So what they then did was start to undermine the Conservative Party and create infighting and disagreement and all the rest of it. And as soon as Tony Blair was e e elected Labour Party uh, leader, after the uh, convenient, shall we say, uh, uh, sudden death of uh, John Smith, the leader at the time, um, the whole um, empire of Rupert Murdoch jumped for the first time in its history from the Conservative Party to the Labour Party and Blair. Through the period of Blair's 10 years, um, virtually all of it, the Conservative Party was targeted uh, and disruption undermined a, a series of leaders that weren't uh, perceived uh, to have the potential to be a Prime Minister. And it was like a reverse of Margaret Thatcher in the 80s. And now they're undermining uh, uh, Gordon Brown and the Labour Party, almost certainly to bring uh, David Cameron in. And, and, and the same thing goes on. Now, this is a global network that has a blueprint globally in how it works. So what I've just described, Gabriel, will be happening in Ireland. And you've got Brian Cowan, vote yes. Is it Edna Kenny, the leader of the opposition? Vote yes. Yes. I think, I think it's Sinn Féin is the only party as I'm... Yep, I'm reading it saying no. Now, this is because there is a united front fronting up for a united force that connects them all at the highest levels. Not every MP, but see, the system is controlled by pyramids. If you want to control a political party, you've got to control the top of the political party, and they dictate to the rest of the party. And if people want to uh, uh, be a minister or, 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 or be a shadow minister or have a, a, any kind of... Um, uh, future political career, then they've got to do what the party says. They've got to follow the party line. So all you've got to do is control the top of these pyramids and you control the party. And so um, it's uh, no accident at all that there's now this, this united front to vote yes, because it's all orchestrated. Okay. Um, you're talking there about, I suppose, leverage, and you're talking about secret societies and the I suppose the, the the Illuminati or whatever they whatever they, they call themselves, uh, Dave. What's their ultimate outcome? What does this group want? Well, this this is um, <clears throat> uh, extremely relevant to what's happening in Ireland at the time at this time and the European Union. I've been writing for the best part now of twenty years, and when people was, were laughing and saying that's ridiculous, well, they're not say, saying it's ridiculous now when they read what I said nearly twenty years ago because it's happening. They um, are a few compared with the global population. These bloodline families are very, very few compared with the, 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 the population of the world, something like 7 billion now. And if you're the few and you want to control the many, there's a crucial, crucial foundation uh, element that you have to do. 
and that's centralized decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, um, the more points of decision making, the more diverse it is, the less control any few can have at the center to dictate to everyone else. If they're going to do that, you have to incessantly centralize power so more and more control and decisions affecting more and more people are made by fewer and fewer people. So, at one point we had a tribal uh, situation in the world where people in the, in the tribe decided the society of the tribe, if you like, and how it was run and all the rest of it. Then we moved to the next stage when large numbers of tribes were brought together under what were called nations. Now, um, a central point is dictating to what were a diverse tribal societies uh, deciding their own destiny, if you like. Now we're well in Europe into stage two, uh, two of this, or the next stage, which is to bring the nations together under a centralized control, so that one point in Europe is dictating to every nation. My goodness, people, look around! It's happening now. It's not coming. It's just how deep we're going to allow ourselves to go into it. Now, the next stage, which I've been writing about for, again, nearly 20 years, is they want a world government, a world central bank <coughs> dictating <coughs> all global finance to every country, a world currency, and the euro is, is a stepping stone to that, a totalitarian tiptoe to it, and that world currency will not be cash, or money you can pick up and look at, it will be an electronic currency, world currency, for which there are fundamental implications for freedom, because if you go into a shop now and you, you, you hand over your electronic money, your credit card, and the computer system says, no, it won't accept your card, then at least you can still purchase with cash. Okay. When there, when there is no cash... Can and I that, jump in, dear? ...and that happens, there's, there's no way you can purchase, and, and that's the idea. Okay, just jump in on that point. Um, I got something here from the Telegraph on the 7th of September, uh, 09, which is a couple of days ago. Uh, the UN Conference on Trade and Development has suggested that the dollar, which acts as the world reserve currency, be replaced by a global currency. There you go. <clears throat> so they're, they're rolling it out. Um, no, some people. But very quickly, you know this, this, this big financial crash, uh, and they're going to crash it even worse, that, you know, it seems to be picking up. That's just to pull more people in. Um, they're going to crash it again. This is all about saying massive financial global problem. The solution is a world central bank, and they are uh, dictating the global finance. And just like that quote from the Telegraph, Gabriel, they're now openly suggesting this as an answer to global uh, uh, economic problems. This is how it works, problem, reaction, solution. Now, some people would say, um, sound like Barry Norman there, some people would say that, a centralized one world government isn't a bad idea okay um a united government like the the the, the idea of, that gene Roddenberry put forth in, in star trek um and in essence it would be brilliant now well i don't think it would you see what's the uh, dis what's the dissonance well, you you don't think no i tell you for why okay. the way the way human uh human consciousness or lack of it uh, operates now in terms of uh, seeking power is it wants power over mm -hmm. it doesn't want to devolve power it wants power over you know um, people say uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely my father used to have a, a, a little twist on that he used to say and, and it's also the case that power attracts the corruptible uh, because that's what they want and so if you um, have a world government that has the power to dictate from round one table to um, the entire global population you have a global dictatorship and by the way in that list of things I've just talked about which is um, world central bank world currency world government etc world world currency whatever they want a world army to impose the will of the world government on any country that that will not accept it that's that's the european army and the gathering uh, uh nato army and the un peacekeeping operation they're all designed to merge into this global army it's all uh, in the plan um and 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 so that's the last thing we need now global cooperation 
Yes. Global coordination? Yes. A body which coordinates cooperation between different countries that says, hey, this country's in trouble. We, we need to help them. Let's we be the coordinating uh, force to do that. Hey, there's this massive earthquake. All these people are die have died and there's this a catastrophe. We will be the central organizing force to have a global reaction and response to that problem. This is n absolutely what we need, yes. But that is so different, Gabriel, to what is being suggested. It's not that that's being suggested. It's a central global dictatorship, not a coordinating body. Okay, so you, you right there, you've hit the, the crux of the problem and the solution. The consciousness, human consciousness. Uh, without the development of that, the system that comes out of or emerges from uh, a non an unevolved consciousness is going to be the same as we have now and the only way to raise consciousness in individuals and thereby um, raise the consciousness of our race is better education more evolved teaching um, in a widespread manner um, and yet the educational system now is I think it's even becoming dumber and it's becoming even more rote. So how would you suggest, um, other than um, making people aware of what's happening, how would you suggest that we uh, implement something to help and aid in that consciousness expansion? Because it's the well, kids. It's the kids. They're not being given a chance right now. Well, uh, uh, there's lots of things that come out of that. First of all, a, 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 a wonderful quote from Albert Einstein, who said, worse to the effect of, you cannot solve problems with the same level of consciousness that created them. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and we're going round and round and round in this world because we're having the same level of consciousness in politics, etc., that created the problems, um, um, uh, trying to find solutions to them. Uh, that's even within that area of, 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 of politician that is, is not consciously involved with the conspiracy uh, which is most of them most of them don't have a clue what's going on uh, and because uh, they're just puppets just pawns but education yeah wouldn't it be nice if we had some because we don't <laughs> have education it would be we a good idea we have indoctrination you know if you were sitting around a table a hundred years or so ago and you were having a, a, a discussion on how best you could turn children into the adults that you want them to be in terms of the way they they they, they perceive the world the way you that, that suits your agenda then you would would sit around the table and you say i've got a great idea i tell you what i don't sure i'm not sure they'll have this but this would be perfect if we could get hold of those children from the age of about four or five and and have access to their minds at least five days a week until they uh, are in their teens uh, and, and coming up to 20s these days, more and more, then we could ensure that the vast majority of those children will become the adults that we want them to be and see the world the way it suits our agenda. And that's what we've got. And what is happening in, in all these um, uh, different areas is the ante is being upped. That it's becoming more extreme. So we're now noticing, you quite absolutely rightly observe, and it's happening everywhere, America, Canada, England, Ireland, the dumbing down of the education system. They want uh, people to be less and less informed, less and less um, educated, and underpinning this is a war on young people and children. Mm. And part of that war is the dumbing down of education and the indoctrination and programming, that's what it is, and, and we talk about what on television, television programs, that's what they are, most of them, programming, programming a sense of reality, dumbing people down. Hey, don't go on the internet and, and search around for what's really going on in the, in the world. Watch this game show. Watch this. Shut up. Uh, and underpinning this also is the uh, extraordinary levels of uh, chemical poisons and electromagnetic and microwave disruption that young people and people in general but particularly young people are being subjected to you know when you look at the 
the graphs of so-called um, rising in uh, childhood uh, behavior difficulties and all the rest of it and attention deficit and all this stuff they talk about you look at the graph of the same years of the increase in chemical cocktail food additives in food and drink and they mirror each other the human body is an electrochemical organism it needs a optimum electrochemical balance to think straight to be balanced emotionally and to be physically healthy what they're doing is bombarding uh, uh, children from the earliest ages now with um, a chemical electrochemical uh, uh, poison and disruption that is knocking that optimum uh, electrochemical balance way out of kilter and so uh, th th they are reacting in the terms of their mental state their emotional state and their physical state exactly as planned because they don't want people particularly as they're heading towards their ultimate goal of this global Orwellian state they are heading uh, in that direction and they want as little opposition as possible and they know that the children of today are going to be the adults that live in the world that they're, they're heading fast towards and we're heading fast towards and they don't want them to be uh, sharp thinkers and to be able to see it and incidentally um, talking about um, how this is projected forward very very relevant uh, Gabriel to what we're talking about here one of the very, very important strands in this network is called the Fabian Society. Fabian Society was um, started in um, 1884, and it spawned the Labour Party, and it has, to this day, uh, a logo of a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it's named after Fabius, a Roman general, who was famous for not going for big pitch in your face uh, on battles but to slowly but surely undermine the opposition over a period of time and that is the totalitarian tiptoe that's classic Fabian society techniques now two members of the Fabian society uh, way back in the 30s were a man called George Orwell real name Eric Blair who wrote um, an incredibly prophetic book but it wasn't prophetic because he had access through the Fabian Society to the projected agenda called 1984 and another um, member of the Fabian Society and, a, and an, an, a friend and associate of Orwell was Aldous Huxley who wrote another book in 1932 it was published called Brave New World now if you put, I said this years ago, if you put 1984 and Brave New World together and you read them both you've got where they want to take the world uh, 1984 concentrates on the Big Brother enforcement of um, uh, of uh, the fascist state. Brave New World comes from the perspective of using drugs, manipulation, mind control, etc., and breeding programs to get to get us a, a situation where a human race doesn't need the 1984 stuff because it um, welcomes and loves its servitude. And okay. what a coincidence, Gabriel, that these two members of the Fabian Society that is, w ha had access and has access to that projected agenda, because this is projected, like I say, over, a, over decades and decades and decades, and they should write the two classic books, uh, novels from their, quote, imagination, like heck, um, that are proving so accurate in the world that we're, we're, we're in now. Okay, let me ask you a question about the Fabian Society, because I've heard um, Michael Tessorian talking about uh, that group. Now, are they just, the Fabian group, are they just one more society or group in a multitude of groups? And who is at the top of the Fabian Society? Well, if, um, if you, you could think of it the spider's web, or you could think of it as... Um, a pyramid uh, uh, structure uh, like Russian dolls pyramids uh, in, in, inside bigger pyramids inside bigger pyramids so for instance um, you've got um, a bank and the bank is a pyramid in itself because the bank manager is at the top in the local branch and he dictates to the staff 
that pyramid goes into the next level of the bank and that pyramid goes into the next level of the bank until you get to the, the, the pyramid that encompasses the whole of that bank globally and at the top of that you've got a tiny few people who are dictating the policy of that entire bank uh, all around the world. It's the same with secret societies. Um, the, you, you have um, the Fabian Society which at the top level, top level will connect into um, other secret societies and what they all do is feed out of their the top of their pyramid into another pyramid which are the Illuminati uh, uh, levels of this whole conspiracy it's um, fiercely hierarchical and it's fiercely compartmentalized so for instance when you are in the Freemasons the vast majority of Freemasons are in the bottom three levels of degree called the blue degrees they don't go any higher and at each level you have no idea what's being taught at the next level and they don't know what being taught at the next level it's fiercely compartmentalized this is how it works so you you've got the vast majority of freemasons for instance have not a clue what that organization is being used for okay and the vast majority of fabians will not know what that organization is being used for this is this is how um it works i'll give you a wonderful example towards the uh, end of the 70s in italy um, a scandal broke involving a Freemasonic uh, lodge called P2. And it was headed by a guy called Licio Gelli, who was a, a, an infamous fascist, a Mussolini fascist. And when they raided his house, they found um, documents that revealed this structure. The P2 lodge, uh, which was an elite lodge of elite people, was broken up into sections. It, it, it con contained major people in the Italian media, politics, military, uh, business, the, the whole uh, span of institutions, what have you. Each, um, if you like, group within the P2 had no idea that any of other, the other, other groups existed. And they had one person at the top of each group, and he only knew what was happening in his group. These people at the top then eventually answered to Geli and Geli and the associates around Geli, a handful of people, were the only ones who knew all the sections that existed and all the people that were in those sections. So you were having P2 initiates um, meeting each other in mainstream society not realizing that the other one was a P2 initiate but they were all being manipulated through this um, structure to advance the agenda that Gelly was pushing. Uh, and this is, how it's, this is how it's structured. This is how it's structured to control political parties, for instance. So the vast majority of people in political parties, although those parties are controlled by the same force, have no idea that that force exists, never mind that it's controlling their party, uh, ultimately. Uh, so the lay changes at every level. Exactly. Very close to the spider the key key family in fact the spider in many ways at operational level is the house of Rothschild and the house of Rothschild were behind the um, orchestration of the uh, European Union when it was started out as the um, the common market and another major major bloodline family in this network that was if you like a specialist uh, family in terms of the European Union is the Habsburg family um, Otto von Habsburg um, created with with others, although he was the boss, um, a organisation called the Pan Europa Movement uh, in the in the kind of the 30s and that kind of period, 30s, 40s. It was operating, and it's still operating today. And Otto von Habsburg is still the head of it. He's in his 90s now, wow. and um, he uh, a, a, and the Pan Europa Movement were the engine room that manipulated into place the common market and one of the major front men that did it for them was a guy called Jean Monnet who is said to be the father of, of, of Europe, the father of the European Union. Jean Monnet was a front man for, the, uh, for these families in the Pan-Europa movement and um, it's um, interesting that uh, I've just got a, a note here in one of my books there was um, a couple of writers, researchers called Mary and Serge Bromberger who were admirers of this guy Jean Monnet and got very close to him and got access to information um, uh, of, of the background to it and they supported him this wasn't an exposure and they wrote a book called Jean Monnet and the United States of Europe and uh, this is what they wrote um, 
in it. It's quite brief, but it's really telling because it was so uh, ahead of what we're facing now. Gradually, it was thought, the supranational authorities, supervised by the European Council of Ministers at Brussels and the Assembly at Strasbourg, would administer all the activities of the continent. A day would come when governments would be forced to admit that an integrated Europe was an accomplished fact without their having had a say in the establishment of its underlying principles. All they would have to do was to merge all these autonomous institutions into a single federal administration and then proclaim a United States of Europe. And that's what this treaty is all about, taking an enormous step to what clearly, wherever you look when you research this, has been the plan from the very start, and that is to create a centralized dictatorship for every country and therefore every person in Europe. It seems to be playing out like that very, very much. Um, can I go just jump back? Uh, yeah. Something's popped into my head. The Aldous, uh, sorry, the Aldous Huxley and yeah. the uh, George Orwell. The two books that they, that they wrote, 1980, 1984, and uh, a brief few words. Close. Okay, if they were involved with um, secret organizations themselves, what was the purpose? Uh, of for them or of them writing and publicizing these um, plans. Well, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, it, it would seem very clear that that Orwell rejected the whole idea and wanted to expose it. Um, and you know, there there have been uh, students of the book 1984 who've actually uh, come to the conclusion that this it was actually set around the, the turn of the 21st century not in 1984 okay. and the reason it is said that it's called 1984 is that it was Orwell's code because 1984 was the 100th anniversary uh, of the Fabian Society um, and he was writing to expose it in terms of Aldous Huxley well, this was a man uh, who um, comes from a family that was heavily into eugenics uh, Julian Huxley, his brother, was a major uh, uh, leader of the eugenics, the master race movement, if you like. Okay. He was the first head of UNESCO. Um, he was um, president of the British Eugenics Society. So uh, he came from some dodgy background, did Aldous Huxley. Uh, why he actually wrote that? Well, in 1932, when it came out, um, it was accepted by all and sundry as a novel because the idea that this was ever going to ha happen was, was, was just unimaginable in 1932. So it wasn't a problem in, the, uh, in those days. And, 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 and you know, even today, if, if you can read Brave New World, uh, it doesn't necessarily hit people when they read it, oh, this is, this is what's planned to happen or this is happening, unless you do the other background research and see the connections that Huxley had and, and Orwell had to uh, understand that this was what was planned to, to happen all along. Um, you know, people who research this stuff, like me, have to really hold on to uh, appreciate that the vast, vast, vast majority of people in this world don't do any research. And so what we, we can see because we do the research and the connections we can see, the vast majority of people don't see. So Brave New World is not a, any threat whatsoever to... Um, the agenda because people won't put the dots together unless they set out to, to do the research to do so um, and you know it made it made him a lot of money <laughs> as well okay yeah. Dave you used to be in the Green Party back in the days right yeah 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 okay what was that big, what was that big about learn, big learning experience okay uh, I, 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 so many things have happened into my life in my life before I um, started to become aware of this in around the very early 1990s and um, um, that, that have been very helpful to me uh, I with what's happened since. And I was um, in the Green Party, um, and you know I saw what was happening to the environment. And uh, I uh, got got involved in the Green Party, and somehow, in, the, in, in, in next to no time, became a, a, a national spokesman in, in the late 1980s. And I um, saw from my experience on the inside that the Green Party is not a different party at all. It just claims to be. It's just the same politics um, dressed up with a different name and with a different dress on. And uh, the environmental movement um, and the, the Green Parties are being played like a violin 
over uh, global warming. In fact, have you noticed, Gabriel, they don't call it global warming anymore. They call it climate change because temperatures are falling. Yes. Uh, okay. And, 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 and uh, so the Green Party uh, also has a policy, and, and right back to the, the days when I uh, was, was there, of a, uh, a Europe of regions, a European Union of regions. So the Green parties have been absolutely played like a violin, manipulated at the top level also. And I, I, I see uh, people I used to work with in the Green Party who are now MEPs and, and leaders of the, leader of the party. And, and I see babes in arms who are parroting the agenda um, and, and saying this is what we must do when they are clueless what that agenda is really about and who's ultimately um, behind it. And, you know, I, uh, I just hope that Green Party members in Ireland, as opposed to their hierarchy in this non-hierarchical party, um, see through this and, and, and see that real green politics, the, the green politics that I came into that movement for, was not about centralization of power. It was about devolution of power. It was about giving power from the center, not to the center. And what the Green Party is uh, are, are saying, or certainly the British one, is oh no, what we do is we have a Europe of regions and then we devolve power to the regions. You must be on something. That's not the idea. And you know, the, the uh, giving uh, parliaments to Wales and parliaments to Scotland, that's not about devolving power, real power to the people. It's about preparing for the breakup of the United Kingdom for the Europe of regions. Um, and, and, uh, okay, give, give a... Give anybody listening a breakdown of the regions, because I have sort of an idea of what this um, um, uh, regionalization will actually do. It'll cause more conflict by um, enforcing or forcing people who wouldn't naturally um, sit together. They'll actually force different regions to become um, linked and involved with other regions. Well, is that, this, is, this is a very this is a very good point. I mean, the 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 map or one of the maps that I saw that was published actually in in uh, the the Daily Mail uh, a year, few years ago, and and you can find it on the internet, breaks the United Kingdom up into regions. But and your your point is is so valid because what it does is group the regions um, between um, Scandinavia, for instance, France and Britain not in groupings of regions within those countries, but it groups a region of one country with a region of another country with a region of another country. So this is all part of the process of absolutely destroying unity. You know, if you're a dictator, the last thing you want is any unified response to your diktats and your, your tyranny. Mm. You, need, you need to divide and rule. And this is what um, this... Um, breaking up Europe into regions and then uh, pulling the regions of one country, region of one country with region of another country with the region of another country is about, it's about dividing and ruling and breaking up any unity of response to the edifice of power uh, above it. Um, it's all very, very carefully coordinated and, it, you know, it's run with supercomputers. They've got, they've got uh, computer... Um, technology, quantum computer technology, which in the public arena they're saying, oh, we know we're heading towards quantum computer technology, we'll be able to do fantastic things. They've already done it. And, and, and this process is, is to a large extent being run by these supercomputers. Um, you know, if you put in, this is the outcome I want, the computer will tell you the sequence of events necessary to get there. This is what they're working with. This is what we're faced with. But the key thing is that at the top, the number of people who are orchestrating this at the top of the global pyramid, at the spider in the center, in full awareness of what they're doing, is tiny, fractional, compared with the global population. That's our strength. Numbers. And increasingly, our strength is becoming aware of the game that's being played on us. Now, we need to come together, we need to put down the fake false, uh, uh, fault lines of religion, of race, of, of, of country, of income bracket, because this is not a tyranny to enslave Irish people. 
or English people, middle class Americans, Jewish people, is, uh, Islamic people or whatever. This is a tyranny designed to enslave all of us and we need to come together uh, uh, united and, and, and put the fault lines of divide and rule aside so, so that we are, we are not uh, sitting in a prison cell symbolically a few years from now saying uh, and arguing about who has the best religion and who has the best this and who has the best political philosophy it won't matter then because it'll all be over and um, this is why we need the unity we need people to become adults grow up stop fighting among ourselves and have a united response to this and Ireland has the opportunity on October the 2nd to do that by saying no across uh, uh, religious belief, political belief, uh, income bracket, and putting a massive spanner in the works of this uh, European Union tyranny, and uh, making a massive statement for, for, for freedom, and, and putting a line in the sand here. That's all possible with this vote, and that's why it's so important. It is, and uh, I just want to add that the no vote in and of itself will halt what is going on now I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and again it's, it speaks so much about what what you're doing they were taking individual um, occurrences that were happening around them and taking them as separate entities let's say the economy or health yep. and they were attributing um, incompetence and stupidity to the basically inefficient system that's no. one of the greatest tricks they use they want people to believe it's incompetence yes. because Gabriel if you don't know what the outcome is and you see something happen you don't know what the outcome is designed to be of that thing happening you look at it in isolation and you say that's stupid it's caused chaos look at it mm -hmm. but if you know what the outcome is designed to be and the fact that that chaos will be offered a solution to bring about that outcome then that chaos has not been brought about by uh, bureaucratic incompetence but by bloody genius that's the difference what we need to do and get out so so quickly and widely is a where they want to take us that's the agenda uh, they want to take us and the world they want to create and problem reaction solution and the totalitarian tiptoe the two key uh, coordinates for the t techniques to take us there when people know those three things they become infinitely more difficult to manipulate uh, and uh, and scam than they were before 20 years ago um, it's, it's almost um, you went uh, on the Wogan show um, yep. and you basically came out and this was sort of the start of the the ridicule and and and, and all that but it was it was quite it was quite an outing and Wogan could have um, I suppose dealt with it a little better but regardless what I want to speak about is you had whether you call it a breakthrough a breakdown an awakening yeah. Um, you, there was a sh huge shift. Can you speak to me about and speak to everyone who's listening? What happened? Well, um, it's a very long story, and uh, it um, involves some absolutely extraordinary events that happened to me from the end of 1989. Oh no, from the start of 1989, um, right through to um, well, present day. But certainly in that, if you like, awakening period. Uh, it was extreme, uh, uh, the, some of the things that happened to me, um, not just in this country, but in other countries, and it led to the Wogan Show. And what happened, I can see clearly now with um, hindsight, is, you know, we are consciousness. We're not the physical body. The physical body is the vehicle that our consciousness uses to experience this reality. You know, uh, I I I'm sitting there here, here at the moment in front of a computer. If I want to go on the Internet, I can't just go on the Internet sitting here in my chair. I have to have a conduit. I have to have a vehicle, an interface that takes me into that reality called the Internet. And it's a computer. And, and through the computer, I can experience the Internet. Well, it's a very, very similar theme in the, the, the reality that we're experiencing. The reality that we're experiencing is simply a tiny range of frequencies that we call visible light, which is really tiny. If you could see the... 
the electromagnetic spectrum, never mind the whole spectrum of, of existence, but just the electromagnetic spectrum, and then see visible light within it, it's tiny. And that's all that we can see. So we're, we're actually at like uh, experiencing a television station with, on a very narrow band of frequency. To do that, we, we experience through a physical body and what we call mind. Uh, mind body is like the computer system. And in fact, as I've shown very clearly in my books, um, when you break down the way the body works, it's a computer system. It's a highly, highly, staggeringly advanced biological computer system, and uh, which has the ability to think for itself, which is which is what the um, immune system is doing all the time. Now, <clears throat> when we get caught, um, let me give you w w one other thing before I say that. Okay. Um, I was in the bath um, about a year ago, two years ago. David, be behave yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I had this. I was. I was at, why it happened in the bath? I don't know. Maybe because I was just pondering, uh, sitting there with me duck. Okay. But I had this very clear picture appear in my mind in Technicolor, and it was of a a swirling mass of energy, which I immediately knew was symbolic of consciousness. It just was came to me very powerfully. Okay. What happened then was an eye appeared in this consciousness. And on the end of the eye appeared a telescope. On the end of the telescope appeared the Earth and this universe. And then the telescope morphed into a human body, which, which was incredibly profound symbolism for the way we experience this reality. We are consciousness. That's what people are experiencing in near-death experiences when they leave the body and they suddenly have this amazingly expanded consciousness that they didn't have in the body. Because um, the body is like a lens, and it, it limits the uh, range of awareness that we have access to, or, or it does at the moment anyway. And so when we get caught in body consciousness, when we get caught in the five senses, and we filter everything through the five senses, it's like um, me sitting here on the internet with this computer, and the computer takes over where I go on the internet and what I think of where I go. In other words, the vehicle's taken over. And, and, and most people are in that state because the system is specifically set up to put people in that state. They don't want people with expanded awareness. They want people with um, five sense awareness, which just um, sees the world that this network wants them to see. What happened to me in... 89 and particularly 1990 when I had an extraordinary experience in Peru um, was that my mind opened my if you like my lens opened I didn't know that was happening at the time and what poured in was an extraordinary mass of knowledge information concepts and insights which just came like a tidal wave and I was, as I look back, in that three months, that's all it was, that period when Ike was a nutter and all that stuff, and the Wogan show, it was only a period of three months. And after three months, everything morphed back into, um, into, uh, I I into where it is now. But, but in that three months, what was happening was uh, very similar to when I'm sitting at this computer. If I tap too many keys too quickly, the computer freezes and goes, sorry, can't process this, I'm not working properly. And what happened to me was I got to a point where I simply couldn't process the information that was pouring into my mind, and, and, and it froze. And in that three months, if you'd have asked me what planet I was on, I'd have to have checked. But like I say, after three months, when the Wogan show had passed and all these other things, suddenly everything morphed into clarity, and like, like the, the computer unfreezing. And people were saying to me, I thought you'd gone crazy, mate. You see, you're the same guy I always knew. They thought I was because I seemed outwardly that I was. But right. something had dramatically changed. I was now not seeing the world that I was seeing before. I was seeing things I didn't see before. And that's when the journey started of putting the dots t t t together that's led me to what I'm doing now. I got you. I got you. And do you, do, do you meditate or what, what healing modalities do you... Uh, use for your own uh, maintenance and expansion. I don't do anything. You don't. I, I tell you, I, I, I just follow the signs of life, and I, 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 I'll make this point, uh, okay. Gabriel. You know, I hear a lot of stuff about meditation, and and good luck to people. If they want to do that, and 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 you know, sitting cross-legged on mountains and all this stuff in the lotus position, right? I tell you what, the, the, in my experience, 
or is all we need to do because everything comes from it. We have to change our self-identity. If, if people self-identify with the reflection in the mirror, mm -hmm. they self-identify with their name, they self-identify with their job. None of these things are who we are. They are what we are experiencing. And David Icke is not who I am. It's what I'm experiencing. I am consciousness, expanded consciousness, just like you are, just like everyone listening to this program is, and everyone on this planet is. The difference is recognizing that and not recognizing that. And if we um, identify with I am Charlie Smith and I work in the store and all the rest of it, then that is the point of the, from which we will observe the world and ourselves. And we'll see ourselves in terms of uh, little me, I have no power, and everything is what they tell me it is. Once you simply consciously move that self-identity from I am David Icke or Charlie Jones or Ethel Smith to I am infinite consciousness, all that is, has been, and ever will be, having an experience as David Icke, Charlie Smith, and Ethel Jones, suddenly everything shifts. Not, you know, exactly that, uh, that moment everything changes, but the shift starts. Um, and that is an energetic shift, and consciousness is energy, energy is consciousness, it's a consciousness shift. And as that shifts, you start to change. You start to see things you couldn't see before. You start to perceive in a much more expanded way that you, than, than you did before. And everything starts to move. Um, because you are moving your point of observation from who we have been manipulated to believe we are to what we really are. And this conspiracy is terrified of one thing more than anything else. Because that brings the house of cards down. And that is people becoming aware of their true nature. Uh, because that will bring the whole thing down. The whole conspiracy depends on billions of people going through their life thinking they are what the conspiracy is telling them they are. We're not. And we need, when we understand that, everything changes. Okay. Okay. Beautifully put. I couldn't have put it any better myself. The reptilians. Um, can you give a little background um, of where these these hybrids fit and let me know let me know and let everyone know what's what's possibly happening well um, they, they fundamentally fit um, what happened in my life is um, once I had this uh, extraordinary awakening which is not just an awakening I'm awake it's a continuing process you just become more and more awake okay um, uh, uh, if you became uh, immediately totally awake then my experience of the computer freezing symbolically would be a fraction of what you'd experience. You'd just blow your mind. So you awaken uh, as you're ready to awaken once the process starts. And for the first few years, um, my life became a, an extraordinary synchronistic journey of amazing coincidences, one of which I happened to, happened to be in Ireland, funny enough. Um, and... Uh, that was leading me to people, places, experiences, documents, books that were handing me pieces in a puzzle that were showing me how the world was controlled by a few people and how and, and what the goal was. Then, suddenly, uh, around the mid-90s, you know, maybe the later 90s, about 96, something else started to come into my life uh, as I traveled around the world. And uh, it became a very common theme. Uh, and it was of people who had seen uh, apparently humans, often in positions of power, but not always, change into a reptilian type figure and then go back again. And you hear one or two and you think, well, that's bloody strange. And then you hear three or four and then you go to other countries and you hear five, six, seven and eight. And then it's like 30, 40, 50. And these people are from all different walks of life. And if you're interested in what's happening, rather than defending a belief system or um, worrying about what people think of you when you reveal this stuff, then you start to look at it more closely. And I started then to uh, look at ancient texts and ancient accounts 
and including biblical texts, which are just ancient texts that have been brought together in a book, like other ancient texts all around the world. And I came across this very common theme, and that is of a non-human race that interbred with humans, creating a hybrid bloodline. Um, the sons of God, which in the if you go take the translation further back, the sons of the gods, it really says, interbreeding with the daughters of men, is just one example in the, the, the Bible text of what you find in uh, cultures all over the world. I then came across uh, a, a man, a, a Zulu shaman in South Africa, who's the official storyteller of the Zulu nation, called Kredo Mutwa, who called me in 1998 when I was speaking in South Africa, and my first book on this reptilian subject called The Biggest Secret had come out, and he just read it, and he called me, and he said, how do you know about the Chittahuri? And I said, well, who's the Chittahuri? And I, I went to see him when he told me, and um, I spent uh, days with him talking about this at length. I did interviews with him, about six hours of interviews, which are available on DVD, in which he just told the story of the Chittahuri, which translates uh, in the Zulu as uh, children of the serpent or children of the python. And he's telling me the stories from Zulu legends going back uh, literally thousands of years, um, the same stories that I'm finding elsewhere in the world. Um, and this has gone on and gone on and gone on and gone on. And it started to, to it's become very clear that these Illuminati bloodlines that are obsessed with interbreeding and holding a genetic structure are hybrids between uh, the human race and these reptilian entities, um, the Chitahuri, if you want to use that, they're called the Nagas in, um, in um, Hindu belief and other names, different names around the world. Okay. And it's interesting because um, books of um, research into serpent worship have established, a, and, and anthropologists, etc., researching into serpent worship. Uh, have found that a serpent worship is the oldest known form of worship it goes back uh, can be traced back 70,000 years and the most all prevailing form of worship across the entire you know cultures of the ancient world and, and, and further back is worship of the serpent and then of course you have um, in the Bible the symbolic um, story of the Garden of Eden which all just by coincidence happens to involve um, the the serpent, and um, it's to do with breeding, and it's to do with the fall of man, uh, as it's described. And um, what you uh, um, are looking at, the the the, the exit from the garden, it, it was a very profound change in human society and human perception when this reptilian group started to impact and influence human society. Now I talked earlier about um, the the way that we can see uh, through the, our human bodies only a tiny frequency range called visible light. But creation is broken up into wavelengths, frequencies. You know, people look up uh, to heaven as if it's in the sky. It's actually all, everything shares the same space that this reality that we're experiencing shares. So um, it's like uh, the, the, the broadcast television and radio frequencies. They're all sharing the same space, but they're not interfering with each other because they're on different wavelengths. They only interfere, quote, impact on each other when they are uh, very close on the dial. And it's the same with realities. Uh, what even mainstream, some mainstream scientists are now talking about parallel universes. They share the same space. They're not on top of each other like chest of drawers. And so it's become clear with the years and years of research that these reptilian entities overwhelmingly operate on wavelengths just outside of visible light. And therefore, cannot directly impact, um, at least for very long, they can come in, that's when you see the shape shift, but they, they can't last very long because there's such a vibrational lack of compatibility. So to, in an ongoing way, manipulate this reality we call visible light, the world, they have to do it through human forms that they can manipulate. And the reason for the interbreeding 
is because everything is energy and everything is vibration. You can, you can look through a microscope at the densest piece of metal or, or, or concrete you like and you, you, you'll see vibrating energy because that's what it all is if you go deep enough. And uh, so the interbreeding, the hybrid bloodlines have a vibrational and genetic compatibility with these reptilian entities which means that they can be, be possessed an age-old thing right up to the present day by these entities in terms of possession of their mental, emotional uh, and physical uh, uh, faculties by these entities. So the, 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 the situation that we're facing is that the reptilian entities just outside of visible light are controlling this whole thing um, and they do it through these um, hybrid bloodlines which operate within this reality and we see them as human because on the level of visible light that's what they are but if you could see just beyond visible light and some people can um, you would see anything but a human entity overshadowing these these major people in power like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and uh, uh, etc and you can think of it like this you know when you um, you see in some of these pictures in laboratories where you've got a big tank and inside the tank is somewhere the scientists can't go because it's too dangerous but they want to work with the stuff that's inside the tank so what they do is they stand outside the tank and they put their arms in these long gloves that go inside the tank and they can manipulate and work inside the tank without actually being in it very, very sim uh, uh, s symbolically, uh, or very close to the truth, is that symbolism in terms of the way these entities um, manipulate through these uh, bloodlines. That's why they're obsessed with interbreeding, and, and that, that's why the same names uh, and families keep coming up again and again and again and again, wherever you look in, in all these institutions and areas of, of, the, of the manipulation. And, and um, again, it's like subliminal... Uh, a subliminal advertisement you can look at a subliminal advertisement and you won't see it and then when it's pointed out next time and every time you look at that advertisement from then on the first thing you see will be the subliminal you couldn't see before why because what has been uh, locked in the subconscious and manipulating us uh, through subliminal um, impact now becomes conscious and no longer has that ability to manipulate because now we can see it. And when you start to open your mind to this reptilian uh, aspect of all this, bring it to the conscious mind, you'll be amazed at how um, you will start to see the subliminal, uh, uh, the reptilian symbolism, uh, the reptilian references um, that, that are all there to be seen, ancient and modern. Okay, um, let let me just do a quick summation so I can get this clear in my own consciousness. Okay. Um, okay, so there's an interdimensional being. Um, not, not being, it's a, it's a series of, of, of entities, it's a group, it's like a... Uh, oh yeah, I'm just taking one, one um, individual as an okay, example. Okay, on the individual it, level, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so there is a, an interdimensional um, uh, shift and the being can't uh, actually physically move anything for long in this dimension, so they need to, they have to have an interface. So a conduit, yeah, exactly. Conduit, so the, they need a vehicle. So yeah. there's human beings who are bred with some of the, the lizard, or the, the lizard, the reptilian, this being's um, genetics. Right to allow um, basically them to enter into that form and to move around in this reality, yeah. in this yeah. dimension. Now, where, where did they get the genetics in the first place if they, where did they get genetics in the first place for the, the hybrid, the, the host? Um, if the well, 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 I mean, these, these, these are, are, are deep questions and, and, and some aspects of them still need to be answered, but they can be answered in, 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 in this way. First of all, they can come into this reality, okay. uh, but they, they can't stay for long. Um, and um, one of the ways that they can stay in this reality 
is by drinking human blood, which carries a massively powerful conduit for the human genetic code um, and the human vibrational code, in other words. And this is why um, the uh, connection can be made over and over again between these bloodlines and satanic ritual, human sacrifice and blood drinking. You see, when um, we have the, this 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 thing right across the ancient world of making sacrifices to the gods the gods were these entities who they perceived to be gods and they were making human sacrifices to these entities because um, they drink copious amounts of human blood to stay in this reality for as long as possible before they have to return to their own because it starts to affect them uh, vibrationally in a very negative way um, it's like um, you know being being in a kind of a laser beam, and and you you know it starts to affect you because it's a, it's it's, you're not, it's not compatible with your with your um, vibrational state. But the other thing about genetics is this: you know we perceive genetics to be about sexual procreation, but everything is energy, everything's vibration, everything, and you can manipulate genetics vibrationally. Because on the, at, the, at the end of the day, everything is, is uh, vibrational. So these um, entities have an understanding of reality, the vibrational nature of reality and the vibrational nature of genetics that we are not even near to, to uh, understanding in mainstream science uh, uh, at this point. And therefore, they are able to do things like manipulate hybrid bloodlines, etc., in, in ways that um, uh, we wouldn't even think were possible. Now, once that um, code, that hybrid code, um, vibrational DNA code, is in the hybrid, then the hybrids within this reality interbreed with each other, and they hold the code within this reality through interbreeding. Yes, that's why they have these uh, interbreeding programs, these um, these bloodlines, very, very um, sophisticated breeding programs uh, through sperm banks and all that stuff. I'm not kidding you. This is this is real. Believe it or not, it, it oh. doesn't me to persuade anybody. What do the entities want? What do the initial the the entities from the say outside or uh, known dimension? What well, do they want coming here? They want they want eventually complete control, and they they want it through through. Um, means of um, the centralization of power through the microchipping of people now all this is all this is doing is getting more and more control and control of the human population right uh, uh, mind control of the human population through through various means including microchips the the, the drugging of the population the imprisoning of the population through um, technological means what the, the microchips not just about electronic tagging a, a CIA scientist told me this um, uh, in 1997 that um, the microchip agenda was not about uh, just about electronic tagging. It's about external manipulation of the mind, uh, emotions, and, and the body of, of people. So you like e ELF yeah, all and, that, and through, other through, stuff. Through connection to the microchip. Now, what we're building towards, Gabriel, to answer your question, is the number of people, humans, in the world today is also vastly in excess of the reptilian entities that are manipulating. So um, even if they came into this reality, they could be overwhelmed by numbers, absolutely overwhelmed by numbers. So they have been working um, over a, this period, and they've been th these entities operating just outside of visible light that operate in a completely different different timeline. God, somebody's trying to ring me out. <laughs> uh, a completely different timeline um, in um, relation to ours. They have been the, the, the conduit, the common force going, going through what we call history. Because people have asked me a very, very good question um, years ago. Why would all these people, these Illuminati people, going way back through history in the centuries, why would they give their lives to um, uh, advancing this agenda when they knew they weren't going to be around to see the end of it? Well, it's because they've just been... Um, if you like, agents of this force, which is the, the, the common theme through, through this whole uh, period of what we call time. Th their relationship to our timeline is very different to the, to the one we have, you know, with a clock and all the rest of it. And they're building towards uh, an end goal 
where they want to have a massive fundamental control of human uh, human people and mind, emotions, body. Um, they want to cull the population by a fantastic number through um, manufactured diseases, uh, laboratory diseases and vaccination programs. That's blooming topical given what they're trying to do to us with this uh, uh, laboratory created swine flu and the uh, uh, swine flu uh, vaccine. I mean, why would they want to mass global vaccination campaign for something that's causing hardly any trouble for anybody? Because it's, it's not about swine flu. It's about um, what, this, what this, this group is seeking to do in terms of the global population. Um, and they want, and they're working on this all the time, they're working to create a physical form that would be, allow them to come into this reality. And um, that was part of what the master race nonsense and program of the Nazis was all about. It was, a, 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 if you like, one, one of the many trial runs and experiments that are going on to try to find a vibrational form that will act as a, 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 a vehicle for these entities to, to, to enter this reality and stay here for as long as humans do. Um, and, uh, you know, this... But, but sound... What do they want? What? Why? If... What? I can't you know... get my head around this. Well, well, get your head around this. Why does someone like Warren Buffett, who is a, uh, a multi-billionaire to the, to the tune of tens and tens of billions, why does he get up with the sun every morning uh, and go about earning more? Why does he do that? Get your head around that. Because when people want power, and this is only one level of it, but when people want power to the extent that these entities want power over this planet and they're... Uh, hybrid expressions want power um, because they just express the mentality of the master um, it becomes an illness, a sickness an irrational desire for control uh, you know why do, why do people um, uh, take children and torture them and, and take uh, kind of joy um, out of seeing the suffering of someone else. Why do they do that? Get your head around that. It's very important that people don't perceive what is possible and perceive what people will do on the basis of what they would do. Because these people do not think like we do. They don't have empathy. One of the things about their genetics is that they do not have empathy. They do not have the ability to empathize with the consequences of, uh, uh, for others of their actions. To them, tens of millions of people dead in a war is a means to an end. Greater centralization of power in the world, which is what the two world wars did, massively so. They can't, don't empathize with the suffering, empathize with the people who lost loved ones. They don't empathize with the people who died in 9-11 and the, the families left behind? It's a means to an end. War on terror, more control, advance the agenda. We need to get our heads around this because if we don't uh, uh, start to see um, reality and perception from where they're seeing it from, we will not understand the nature of what's happening in the world and what's planned. And we need to see it pretty damn bloody quick because we're at a fork in the road here, and we can't stand around looking at the map any longer. We've got to start getting involved, otherwise we're going to regret it. Let's start with the referendum in Ireland. Okay. Uh, I'm, I really have a tough time. Now, I've heard, I've heard this over and over. Uh, a couple of nights ago, um, I've been in David Icke overload for the last couple of days, and I'm just watching and trawling through, through some of your work. Yeah, let me just say this, Gabriel. Yes. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get your head around anything. I'm just giving you information. You know, you you then make of it what you will. And if you can't get your head around it and you reject it, well, good luck to you, mate. Let's have a beer and talk about the football. <laughs> it's, just, it's just information. Yep. But I am not going to be um, suppressed from saying what I have um, researched to be the case an experience to be the case, just because people won't get their heads around it or think I'm a nutter. I couldn't give a damn. I'm interested in what's going on, not winning a popularity contest. Okay, what, what, I'm, what I'm feeding back to you is 
the I suppose the conflict or the lack of understanding within myself. And if I'm if I'm experiencing that, then this is more than likely the normal reaction that everybody will go through when they first are introduced mm -hmm. to the information. So um, <clears throat> Arizona Wilder, that was the, the documentary that I had watched. Right. Um, I found it fascinating on many levels um, and uh, not incredible, but fantastical. It was the most fantastical thing that I had encountered till date. And I've encountered some weird stuff. <sighs> so stick around here a bit longer. <laughs> I, I, I intend to. How how do how do you out one of these hybrids? What do you look for? What's what's the evidence procedure? What how do I start now to expand my scope, clean my lens to see what I need to see if this is true? Well, um, I, I, I'll tell you a quick story. A friend of mine who works in the scientific and, and medical um, arena, and he has a um, he has a, a friend who uh, is a scientist, and his friend is not aware of the fact that I know this guy, and uh, not aware, um, as far as I know, of my existence. Um, and he's been working. Um, in the last year, uh, on something I don't agree with, uh, this this um, the scientist, uh, which is um, technology for iris scanning. It's um, led to him looking in very very close microscopic detail at about two thousand three hundred, I think it was, pairs of eyes. And he said to my friend, the strangest thing about this research is I found about four percent of those eyes to be of reptilian type. And I don't understand why. Four percent is about the ratio of reptilian hybrids to the general population. That it would seem to me, from my experience. Um, so people are beginning to, um, uh, you know, recognise that something in in this um, area um, doesn't add up, and and starting to recognise the whole uh, reptilian aspect to this. You know, um, when I first came across it I put reptilian entities reptilian e extraterrestrials reptilian interdimensionals into search engines and I got literally a handful of pages you put that in now there's tens of thousands of them um, and uh, so uh, people are becoming more aware of this but you know they operate outside visible light unless they come into visible light we're not going to see them hmm. simple as that um, but you know what I what I do now because I've had a lot of experience of this. You can start to recognise energies because these these people have a specific energy, but you have to feel it and and become to recognise it, and then you feel it coming off people. One one of one of the ways of recognising um, them that I've seen is when no matter what um, their face is doing, whether it's smiling or whatever it's doing, laughing, their eyes never change. Their eyes hold a steely, cold, emotionless look. Um, and uh, that's because the whole idea of the eyes being the window on the soul are very, very true. Because the eyes are a vehicle for seeing through into um, a deeper level of consciousness. And that's why when you, if you, if you look in people's eyes, no matter what gift of the gab they're giving you, you can tell if they're genuine or not. And I'll tell you an experience that I had um, with regard to this. And this happened way before I was into any of this. And I didn't understand what happened until I, I, I started to, to, to uncover this stuff. I was a Green Party spokesman in 1989 when we had the one major result that we ever had with the European elections of 1989. And the opinion polls uh, were showing that we were going to do very well. So for the first time ever, a Green Party spokesman and uh, spokespeople, whatever you want to call them, were invited onto the election night programs uh, as the results were coming in. And I was invited onto the Sky News election program live. I turn up. I'm taken into the um, makeup room, and as I walked in, the door was open, and to me, there was no one in the room. And she led me to a chair, and she said, uh, someone will be with you shortly, walks out. I think I'm in an empty room. So I sit down, look at the mirror, as you do, and then I caught something in the corner of my eye on the right, and I turn around, 
and sitting there was Ted Heath. Okay. Prime Minister of Britain from 1774, very topical given what we've been talking about here. Um, he was the man who did more than anyone to talk um, Britain into the common market and actually signed us in. Um, and I looked across to him, as you do, and you know, he was a former Prime Minister. He'd just been interviewed on the program, I found out, and he was waiting to have his makeup taken off. Um, and I said, all right, all right, mate, you know, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. He never said a single word at any point. But what happened was this. He turned and looked directly at me, and his head never moved once he'd turned. And then his eyes were the only thing that moved, and they started at the top of my head, and they slowly worked down my body to my feet, stopped, and slowly went back again to the top of my head, at which point he turned, not ever saying a word in the entire process, and just looked at the mirror, as if I wasn't there. And all I can describe it as, he was scanning me. Now, the point of telling you this story is that while he, he was, quote, scanning me, his entire eyes, both of them, the whites included, went jet black. Um, there was no color, no pupil, no white. They were jet black. Um, and as I looked at him, um, as we look in the eyes of people, we have what we call eye contact. There's a point where our eyes are contacting each other and making a connection. When I looked into his eyes when they were in this blacked out state, um, there was no point where I could make contact with his eyes. And I described it to my family uh, later as like looking into two black holes that just went on into infinity. And na uh, years later, two things. First of all, as I was traveling the world, I started coming across the theme of what were called the black eyed people. And people were telling me exactly the same experience they'd had that I'd had with Ted Heath, and I hadn't told them about Ted Heath. And um, the other thing is that I realized that uh, when I started to understand the way reality works and the illusory nature of reality, that um, I was looking um, at Ted Heath through his eyes into the dimension where the entity controlling Ted Heath actually operates, actually uh, exists and manipulates him from. I mean, he's dead now. But um, I, I wrote about Ted Heath in, in um, um, a book, um, The Biggest Secret, um, in which I described him as a, um, a child killer and um, a Satanist. And um, a journalist called Ted Heath um, when the book came out and read that passage to him. And um, he... Um, never contacted me, never tried to stop publication, never uh, challenged it in any way, because to do so would have brought it to the surface far more than it would have been normally, because I know from people that, that, that are involved with, were involved with him that that's exactly what he was. And again, Satanism and these bloodlines go hand in hand, as does child abuse. Um, extraordinary. Um, common theme uh, wherever you, you go with these bloodlines well uh, and, and and so um uh quick question wh wh how more, more, why are you still people, alive well more people are going to see these um uh, uh entities as as, as and there's an energetic shift going on gabriel and as it as it goes on they're going to find it harder and harder to hide from us more and more people are, are going to see them indeed they probably are because you know there's more and more talk about them all the time mm. on the internet etc why am i still alive i've been asked that question for nearly 20 years well this is the reason and it, and it's good news and, and whether people <laughs> accept this or not I, I don't I don't really care I, I, I don't care about persuading people and what people think I'm just saying what I what I've experienced and, and what I'm aware of and people accept it or don't accept it that's fair mm -hmm. enough but there is another force at work um, which is um, in the process of helping people who want to help themselves <coughs> ie awaken mm -hmm. to bring this house of cards down to bring an end to this and um, that force um, is far more powerful if you connect with it. That's the point. People say, when's the cavalry come in? The cavalry's already here, but it's not about the cavalry coming to you because they'd have to come down to your vibrational level. They wouldn't be the cavalry anymore. 
you need to awaken to access their uh, energetic field and then you can, they can start to be influenced. Uh, you can start to be influenced by them in a very positive uh, and uh, a, a positive way. And it's not just as easy as you come into this world to try to make a difference and you're making too much of a difference, so bang, bang, goodbye, get out of here. The people that get taken out are the people that are still in the five cents level of this uh, conspiracy and therefore are operating within its field of influence. If you can open your consciousness and connect with uh, these, these, this force which is waiting to um, uh, help us you know, get rid of this nonsense and bring, bring back uh, the, the world as it was before, paradise, before this um, intervention, this uh, symbolic or more than symbolic fall of man when, when humans became something far more limited than they were before thanks to this intervention and manipulation. If you want to open awareness and connect with that force, then you, you won't be taken out. You won't be taken out because it's more powerful than those who are trying to take you out. Uh, people can accept that or not accept it, but it's, 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 it's the truth. Okay. And so I, um, I've not been taken out, and I will not be taken out because they can't do it. End of story. And, and okay, Ike's a nutter, but it's the truth, and people are going to see that. They can make life difficult for me. My goodness me, they have. Mm. But they can't take me out. And they'll make life more difficult for me in the future. The closer I get to the truth and the more effective this information is, is, is in being circulated. Not just for me, but all the other people doing it. We, you know, we've got to have a bit of backbone here and keep walking forward no matter what the challenge is. But can they take me out? No, they can't and they won't. And okay. eventually, this control system's coming down. Right. So I've asked you a question. You've given an answer and you're, you yourself say, it's just information. You don't have to take it. Think about it and make up your own mind. No, that's, last, the, that's, the, that's been, democracy. Yeah, the last thing I'm trying to do, the last thing I want to do, Gabriel, <laughs> is to convince anyone of anything. Because mm. the last thing this world needs is someone else standing up and saying, I've got all the answers, you must believe me. And if you don't believe me, you're wrong, right? Yeah. That's the last thing we I mean, need. The world's awash. We Agreed. In it. Agreed. So, we, do, we don't so need another messiah. It's There's some information. Make of it what you will. And you know... Not only am I not attached to what people make of it, it's none of my business. If I think it's my business to get people to, to believe what I'm saying, then, then I'm not respecting their, their, their ability to, um, to, to, to be their own free self. So it's information. Make of it what you will. Whichever, whatever people make of it, I'm at peace with either way or whatever. Okay. Okay, I like that. I like that. You, uh, David, you were um, scheduled to come over to Dublin and... It didn't happen. Was that what, what happened there? Well, it's a strange thing, really. Um, I was asked to come over. It was it was all through third parties, by the way. So I'm, you know, um, speaking on the basis of what I've been told. What I'm told appears to be the truth. Okay. Um, uh, that I was invited to to go over and speak and and reveal at a public event, which I was going to do for nothing and you know pay my own expenses, everything, uh, to come over and um, and present um, the the dot connecting. Uh, dock connecting two hours to two, three hours, putting this whole uh, Irish referendum vote into the wider context, etc. Yes. And it was all seems to be going well. Some friends of mine went over to Ireland to discuss it with, with some people and try to find a venue and all the rest of it. And then I just um, got told that there was uh, there were some people um, within the no vote um, groups who were basically said they were going to cause big trouble if I went and uh, that um, me going there and speaking about this would discredit everything and um, basically they weren't going to have me. So uh, I didn't come. Um, so uh, th that was a pity. But, um, you know, we, we, you know, people want the information. They've, they've had it in this interview, mate. So um, it gets there in the end. Yes. Yes. But that's, one of, that's one of the, I suppose, uh, point that some people bring up. Um, when I suppose they're compartmentalizing your your truth, they they want you to do your work, but they don't want you mentioning the the lizards. Well, they 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 don't want me doing my work. This 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 uh, this group of people in 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 Ireland because whether because I wasn't going to come. I was talking about 
shape-shifting reptilian entities and all the rest of it. I was going to talk about the European Union and uh, the, the very five-sense five cents level of this whole um, European Union scam and, and how it connects into other areas of what's going on. Um, you see, what it is, I, I said this years ago, you know, in one of my books, people come out of the womb and they start walking. Um, some don't w walk very far before they pitch their tent and say here or no further. They're the people that read the sun or whatever and, and, and believe the date, you know. Um, the other people keep walking and they, they may um, become environmentalists, say. And to the people um, who pitch their tent first, the environmentalists will seem extreme and uh, crazy. And other people keep walking through where the environmentalists have pitched their tent, and they get into uh, the five sense level of this conspiracy, for instance, and the environmentalists think they're extreme and crazy, and uh, the ones further back think they ought to be put away in asylum or something. And then there are others, very, very, very few, who keep walking through the five sense level of this conspiracy, um, and uh, they keep walking because I haven't got a pe I, have, I haven't got a tent to pitch, and I will not pitch my tent anywhere because I'm not presumptuous enough to think that I will ever know enough to pitch my tent and say I've got it now. Um, and as you keep walking um, down the road, it becomes a lonelier and lonelier place because there's fewer and fewer people on the road, and the five sense conspiracy people who the environmentalists think are crazy and the other people behind them think are uh, lunatics and, and, and utterly insane they start to think you're crazy and you're insane because you're walking along the road and you haven't stopped where they've pitched their tent. And what you find is what I'm saying here, that wherever you people pitch the tent in terms of this is what I believe and no further, they perceive people that go on further in the same way that people further back perceive them. In other words, they're mirrors of each other while they think they're different. And um, all I had with the experience in Ireland there was people that had pitched their tent and were acting towards me the way people um, were acting towards them, saying that, that no vote and there's a conspiracy and the, uh, the EU is all a nonsense. And I do say to people, you know, have just a look when you react, in whatever way you react, at whether you are reacting in the same way as people you criticize for reacting in that way. <laughs> because it happens all yeah. the time. We all yeah. have to be very careful of that. Yes. That's, that's, that's what's happened in... in, in relation to me but it doesn't matter because I get the information now anyway and and those people will eventually see the the, the, the fact that they were um, doing what others do to them I mean I, I'm in a situation now purely by keeping going when all seem lost and I couldn't walk down any street in Britain without being laughed at by the majority of the people and my kids were laughed at and ridiculed at school and I I could just had to turn the television on to hear my name uh, said, uh, and a comedian got a joke. No joke, no, got a laugh. No joke necessary. And by keeping going and sticking with what I believe to be right, I'm now talking all over the world to thousands and thousands of people at a time. Uh, 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 and and that would not have happened if I'd have given up. At, at any scale of resistance and 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 uh, pressure to 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 stop. And that's why I say, I say that to people. If you believe in what you're doing, then you have no reason and no excuse to stop doing it just because people make life difficult for you. Well we said, sir. Well said. Here. And, we need, and we're going to need some big backbone in the next few months and years before this, this the, uh, control system comes down. Because it's going to go a lot further forward um, in terms of its extremes before the, the, the whole thing collapses. Yeah, it does seem to be speeding up. David, it's been an absolute pleasure connecting with you. Yeah, it's been good, Craig. Uh, Thanks very much. I've enjoyed it. Uh, a really, uh, you're welcome to come back whenever you want. Okay. Um, and it's, it's it's okay. Just before we we end up, um, guys and dolls, DavidIke.com. That's your uh, official website. There is the one. yeah, there is a host. Of, of good stuff on that site. So it's davidike.com. Uh, you can visit there. You can sign up. Um, there is tons of information right there. Um, David, any last words? 
Well, yeah, part of, in terms of the website, you know, people can um, uh, subscribe to my newsletter where I, I give up-to-date articles of what's going on and background stuff um, every week. Um, but apart from that, everything else on the site is, uh, is free. All that information you talk about, it's all free because um, we need to circulate this um, um, very urgently. And do you know what's, what's really good is that um, fantastic work by a lot of people over the last few months has, has got out so much um, powerful um, information and background knowledge about this swine flu uh, vaccination program and, and the background to it and the connections and the people involved. All the same people behind the European Union, ultimately. Um, and uh, this has created a, 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 a very large uh, resistance to having the vaccine. So um, it's amazing what you can do if you don't take no for an answer and you, um, you do everything you can, because um, people are now, and I'm the barometer for this after the last 20 years of this, um, people are now more open, magnificently more open in terms of numbers to um, things they would have laughed at or uh, just poo-pooed uh, yeah. not so long ago. Yeah. Than ever they have before. Uh, w this is a very challenging time, but it's a time of great opportunity too, uh, to make a difference in the world. Excellent. David, thank you very, very much. Pleasure. Thank you.